Conclusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Toxicology, astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we encapsulate weird and wonderful science beamed directly into your ears. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Thomas Grant talks about platypus science. But first up, here's news of mobile weather. Five G hurricanes. The twenty four gigahertz radio frequencies being sold for faster five G mobile phone networks will interfere with detecting the twenty three point eight gigahertz frequency at which water vapor in the atmosphere emits a faint signal. This means that five G networks block weather satellites from seeing water vapor in the air, so meteorologists won't be able to warn people to prepare and evacuate for the really big storms. We just won't see them coming. The basic problem is that the water vapour signals are very faint and the phone signals right next to them are loud enough to completely drown them out and too close to be filtered out. 5G promises up to 10 gigabytes per second speeds in cities where 4G has become congested but because it has such a short range it won't help anyone in the countryside. The American Federal Communications Commission has already sold off the first chunk of the 5G spectrum in the US for $2 billion, allowing radio signals close to the water vapour signal that are over 150 times more powerful than what's allowed in Europe, and 3,000 times more powerful than is recommended by the scientists at the World Meteorological Organization. In the USA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and the National Space and Aeronautic Administration, NASA, have finished a study on the effects of differing levels of radio noise interference, but the report hasn't been made public, despite at least one formal request from Congress. Neil Jacobs, the acting head of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, told Congress that 5G interference could set the accuracy of weather forecasts back 40 years down to 1980 levels, a reduction in accuracy from what we have now estimated to be more than 30%. In the US, the Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association tried to mislead people by claiming weather satellite sensors that use a 23.8 GHz frequency were cancelled before they were launched, so there's nothing to protect. However, it turns out that while the first sensors to use 23.8 GHz to detect water vapour were cancelled, it was because the engineers chose to launch a similar but better sensor in its place using the same frequency of water vapour. The next group of three frequency bands being auctioned in the US by the Federal Communications Commission will block those used for satellite observations of rain and snow in the 36 to 37 GHz band. Atmospheric temperature in the 50 GHz band and cloud and ice in the 86 to 92 GHz band. It's like they don't want us to see what's happening to the weather. Weather patterns in Europe are often steered by conditions over the United States three to four days earlier, so that weather forecasts are likely to suffer all over the world. In Europe, Switzerland has switched on its 5G network in April 2019, and the UK followed in May. Soon afterwards were Spain, Italy and Germany with their own 5G networks. Around Asia, 5G has started rolling out or has been licensed to be rolled out in 2020. Indonesia rolled out 5G in 2018 for the Asia Games. Those watching the games in Indonesia were able to experience a number of different sport-related VR activities, ride in autonomous vehicles and use tablets all powered by 5G technology. South Korea will start its 5G rollout later in 2019 after demonstrating the technology at the Asia Games. Malaysia will roll out commercial 5G in 2020. 
Vietnam has sold some 5G licenses, and the Philippines, Singapore and Thailand have announced that they will start rolling out 5G in 2020. Australia has sold off some of the 24GHz spectrum and started operating 5G networks, even though very few devices have been sold to take advantage of the technology. 5G in Australia has been bungled so that speeds enjoyed by early adopters have been lower than the 4G that everyone already uses. The whole 5G blocking of weather measurement and forecasting will be discussed at a global conference in Egypt later this year. But it will be too late as the companies have captured governments that put business ahead of common sense, and the frequencies will all already have been sold. We all want faster wireless data, but surely we could wait for a year or so and jump straight into the even faster speeds of the next generation of data communications while leaving the weather forecasting frequencies clear and save our people, farms and businesses from the ravages of unpredictable weather? Next time there's a killer storm coming, don't expect your super fast phone data to warn you in time. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Platypuses! Tom Grant is a visiting fellow at the University of New South Wales in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Despite his retirement from academia, Tom is continuing his research into platypuses, as he's been doing since the 1970s. I began by asking Tom... I've read that platypuses have lost their stomach in the course of their evolution. Is it true? Well, not really. It, they do have a stomach. It's very small. It doesn't appear to have much in the way of glandular secretions, which stomachs normally do. So maybe they have the stomach has been reduced in, in terms of, of, of their diet. But they still do have a very small stomach. And one of the problems with, with trying to work out what platypus are eating or what animals are eating Quite often, turtles, for example, you can suck the stuff out of the stomach, but these don't have a stomach, uh, or it's very small, so not much in there. And so what we do to find out what they're eating is to... What they do is they dive down, they pick stuff up from the bottom, come to the surface, and then they chew it. Uh, don't have teeth. Their teeth are replaced by horny ridges, which are made out of keratin, the same as your fingernail. And these are replaced constantly because they're wearing away from chewing. They mash the stuff up and they store it in a couple of cheek pouches on the side of their side of their bill and when it's swallowed it's very, very finely ground. So the other way to work out what animals are eating is what comes out the other end. But what comes out the other end is very unpleasant and smelly and very black. So we work out what they're eating by what's in stored in these cheek pouches. There's also some new stuff being done by um, carbon to nitrogen ratios in in their fur or in their body tissues indicates of what the ratios of that in the, the prey species in the, which ones they're actually assimilating once they eat these but actually physically working out what they're eating is getting a little spoon and taking the stuff out of these cheek pouches and then looking under a microscope and it's all divided up into little bits and you get an expert I'm very bad at it, but there's a, a fellow, Richard Martin, who worked in Victoria at the Victoria Museum, who's very good at it, and he's done a lot of our analysis of, of what they're eating. Is it mainly fish? No, it's not fish. It's actually small, the what are called macroinvertebrates, which are the little, mainly larval forms of dragonflies, caddisflies. They're eating water beetles, they're eating small mollusks, small freshwater mussels, the tiny ones, not the really big chunky ones, and they're eating freshwater snails, the, the little ones of them, and they're also eating yabbies as well, and that's one of the problems with us getting caught in yabby traps, because they're going in to get the yabbies, that's why they're going into the trap. Lots of places we look, they're not a huge component of what they're eating, and of course yabbies are unevenly distributed, so platypus picks up a yabby, 
probably go, goes back to his burrow for, for a day and a half and, and feels very satisfied because what they're normally feeding on are very small things, less than a centimetre in length in lots of cases. So they've got to eat lots of them. So they're diving something like 72 times in an hour and so they're up and down, up and down and to get all that stuff that they need to eat. So it's hard work and they do most of that during the night. They come out, time to see them is, is dawn and dusk because they're coming out of that time but they are staying out. We've radio tracked animals that are staying out right through the night and foraging through the night. And as it gets colder, they have to eat more and so quite often you see them in the winter more often because they're out feeding more often. But also, the end of the winter, they're coming out into their... they're starting to breed. So the males, which have a spur, a venomous spur, which they use on each other and we assume, we, we don't have confirmation of this, but we assume because that the venom they produce, the amount of it increases and the gland that produces it increases in the breeding season and they do, we do get them with punctures in each other, particularly the, the males are punctured and we presume they're fighting either over the territory or over access to females. But that field work on, it's been looked at in, in captivity a bit, the mating behaviour has and it's well documented, but in the wild how they're actually, their territoriality, if it, if it does exist, or the, the hierarchy of breeding, for example. In my study here, there's been some genetic work done, although it's, it's still inconclusive, and it doesn't seem from there that, that there are only one or two males that are contributing mainly to the population. And so that, we don't really know about their, their social system and how they hang together and you know who the who the breeding males and females are although we do get some females that in my study area I've caught them originally as juveniles and they've gone on to breed in the in the area and some of them breed over a large number of years one for example the, the longest one that's the longevity in in the wild is 21 years old most of them are going from sort of about 12 maybe to to 15 Males probably a little bit less in, in if they're fighting and doing, doing things, but in captivity there's been a male that's, that's gone for 20 years. But I had a female that was 21 years old and she was lactating, she was, she was breeding in a, a, that final time we caught her over that 21 years. We didn't catch her again, so we presume that she has gone now. But So some of them stay and breed in that area for, for quite a long time, but... The understanding of, of their reproductive breeding system, we, we don't really know. Because it's hard, because they're very cryptic, they're small, smaller than most people think. They dive a lot, they spend a lot of time underwater, so you can't see them. And most of the day, they spend in their burrows in the, in the side of the bank, so you can't actually work out, out what they're doing. And because they're out at night, you've got all the problem. With, um, and people have... The, certainly the photography people, the, the, the documentary makers have produced some wonderful stuff with infrared photography and some stuff with the Japanese have done it with just putting a red filter because they know red light's there but they're not as sensitive to it as they are lot, lots of animals. And they've picked up some fantastic footage of, of them doing things but we haven't pieced that together into, into how the behaviour works. They're very unusual in all sorts of ways, aren't they? So they've got an electric sense when they hunt? Yeah, they do. They, the bill, uh, which is the, you know, the thing that was really the early, the early people who got skinned with, oh, gee, what's this? Uh, is it a bird? Is it a mammal? But it had fur. And early on it was worked out that it, it produced milk, so it was definitely a mammal. But the, nobody really knew how they found their food, and the thing, stuff's really small. And... There was some work done at New South Wales University, Ros Boringer, a, a friend of mine, and she l- looked at what was happening in the brain and they were actually sensitive to, to touch more than they were to, to, to smell or taste or anything because their nostrils are closed, their ears are closed, their eyes are closed when they're underwater. And uh, she worked out that 
there was areas in the brain had much more input from areas on the body, particularly the bill, had much more input to the brain. And so it was thought that they went round sort of touching things or actually getting touch from currents coming back from things moving or water moving over rocks, etc. And then in 1986, there was a German person working at the ANU, I think, from memory, and he had done work on electrosense and sharks because they have these sense organs along their lateral line that pick up electrical fields so that when you're swimming and away from a shark, your muscles are generating electrical fields and that field can be picked up by sharks. And he looked at the bill and saw that there was very similar looking structures in there. So they did some experiments and sure enough they were picking up electrical fields. And the only problem is that when a lady from Queensland did some work, the electrical field generated by the small things that they're picking up were not strong enough to fire off the information in the brain. So somehow it gets amplified so they can pick it up. Some of them did have electrical fields strong enough to say that's a yabby out there, but some of the smaller things, the caddis fly and, and mayfly larvae, weren't generating fields, their muscles contracting big enough for them to pick up. So there's been sort of a lot of controversy as to how they, and some of the electrophysiologists think that it is possible because there's so many of them, there's thousands of these nerve sensors in the bill that pick up electric fields there could be an amplification effect that enables them to do that. So at the moment they're the idea, and they move their heads back and forward, that they're actually picking up, they're touching, they're picking up movements of, of water, etc., and they're picking up electrical fields generated from the muscle contraction of their prey, yeah. So it's quite, yeah, very... Quite impressive. Yeah. And have they always been this little tiny size, or have were their ancestors much of a different size. Yeah, th- these ones have always been th- that size, although they, they're much smaller in Queensland than they are in, in... So they get bigger as they come down, and the Tasmanian ones are, get up to 60 centimetres in length with two feet and up to three kilos in weight, whereas on the mainland, a big male is probably around about maximum two kilos, and the females are around about, in, in Tasmania, are over two kilos but on the mainland, they're about around about a kilo, slightly heavier. In North Queensland, the biggest males are about a kilo and a bit, and the females go down to sort of about probably seven, six or seven hundred grams, which is quite small. And but they've always been that that size. This one, which has probably been around for around a million years, but nobody's really sure. But there are other ones that have, the paleontologists have, have stuck into the, the Ornithorhynchidae family, the same family as the platypus, uh, that there's one particular one that was found just a few years ago, which is about one and a half times, not quite two times, the, the original platypus. And it had teeth that right through, whereas the platypus loses... It has teeth when it's born, but before it comes out of the burrow, these teeth disintegrate or very soon after it comes out of the burrow and starts chewing hard stuff, they disintegrate, and these horny ridges take over the, the chewing uh, function. But these bigger ones that they've found, and that, these ones, that one I think is, whew, I'm testing my memory now, it's about 15 to 20 million years, I think, but you're testing my memory there. There's certainly a couple of others that are around 15 to 20. They're not much bigger than, than the platypus, although one of them, uh, of Duranon Dix and I, had a much, much bigger bill than the, than the modern day platypus and also had teeth in its jaw as well. Um, but they're looking at, these are bits that they've stuck together and, and constructed an animal from it. I'm always a bit <laughs> cynical about that, <laughs> building a old animal from a tooth. They've got a, they've got a 62 year old tooth or it might be in two teeth from Patagonia and they've constructed an animal there. So the monotremes, the groups they belong to, were once in South America as well. And whether they started there and came here or they started here and went there, we don't know. How do the platypus look after the young? So the young hatch from eggs. Yep. 
Do they go to a pouch? No, they don't. In their kidna, they hatch from the egg and the, the kidna doesn't have a pouch in the non-breeding season, but in the breeding season, muscle contraction forms a sort of pseudo-pouch which they, they get into. Once they become spiny, mum leaves them in the, in the burrow. But with the platypus, they hatch from the egg, the mother incubates the egg on a body and puts a tail over the top of them. When they hatch, they come out, they're only, they're very, very small, they're about one centimetre long. Actually, the egg is, is about 15 millimetres long by about 12 millimetres wide. So the young's smaller than that. And they come out and then they mother as mammary glands, but she doesn't have any, any nipples that they can grab onto. So the milk comes out through the fur and the, the, the young one, we, we don't know, we've not seen it done, takes the milk off, off the fur. And so they, they are mammals, they've got mammary glands, of course. And these were found very early on the skins, attached to the skins that were, and they increased dramatically in the, in the breeding season. And they produce a lot of milk. It's very nutritious milk, it's got a lot of fat in it. And so the growth rate is, is quite rapid. From when they're born, when they're about around a centimetre, maybe slightly bigger, and four months later, when they come out of the burrow for the first time, they're weighing around about somewhere between sort of 400 and 600 grams in size. So they're about two-thirds adult size when they come out of the burrow. For, they're fully furred, all that sort of thing. So all that development, which is quite rapid, from bald, small, through to furred and, and, uh, and aware of the world and going out and feeding for themselves, takes about, it, they're in the burrow for about four months. It's about 10 days from hatching, from, from laying to hatching. It's about 21 days from mating to the egg being laid. In New South Wales, the, the eggs are usually laid somewhere around about end of August or September, and then the young come out of the burrows in sort of in January into, into February. So they're spending a lot of that, that time in there, and they're taking the milk from mum without having a, a nipple to grab onto. The milk has uh, recently been found to have antimicrobial protein in it, which is also found in echidna milk. And they think that's due to the fact that they're taking milk from off the outside of the body, which is dirty. So they'll be taking in lots of bacteria and things as well. So the milk having an mi- antimicrobial capacity is, is a good thing. So they're, they're very interesting, but they're also, we've got a, a problem in that with the, the previous droughts plus this current really severe drought and more to come if, if the climate means that we're going to have less water. This is a water dependent animal and other droughts and it's had quite a lot during the, during the million years it's been here it's made its way through in refuge pools and then once the rivers start to flow again they've reinvaded. But now the problem is that they're competing with us for water. They need the water to get their food in and live in we need the water for all the things we do, farming, industry, you know, drinking, all the rest of it. And so us taking the water is a, is a big problem. I mean, building dams, pumping water out of streams, it's, we've got to ba- balance this because this is an animal that we have stewardship over. Nobody else has it. Only Eastern Australia has it. And we've got to build that into planning and management of, of, of water resources. It's as simple as that. And if we don't, We'll lose it. Well, it's something we really must make sure doesn't happen. Thomas Grant, thank you very much. Not a problem. Good to talk to you. That was Tom Grant, visiting fellow at the University of New South Wales, talking about the science of platypuses. Listen next week for Tom's take on platypus preservation. We are afflicted in this nation. We are afflicted with this disgusting, mud-sucking creatures for which the only form of control is a version of herpes. We on the coalition are going to make sure that we have a healthy river and a healthy economy because we're going to get rid of the carp. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contribution 
opinions, helpful suggestions, and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mounts of New South Wales, 8 C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MVR in Nambaka Valley, 3MVR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, 2XXFM in Canberra, and my local station, 2RDJ in Burwood, New South Wales. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 950 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords, so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.